Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, the second FreeBSD office hours. Now at our, our temporary later time. Um, actually, I have a link for a poll about what times uh, would be convenient for you. Um, and I'll drop the link in the chat and uh, it'll be in the video description below if you're watching this on YouTube later or anything like that. Uh, and if you vote, you can uh, help us decide when to have office hours uh, next. Yes, uh, we will. This particular time was chosen to try to be easier for people in Asia and Australia and so on. Uh, we, at worst case, we would only have every second one at this hour uh, and the alternate ones at some other time. Uh, so we have our first question from IRC. John, could you read that for us? Absolutely, Alan. So uh, Bruce asks, my question is, is slash boot still necessary in FreeBSD 12.x? I have uh, boot dir slash boot or boot pool slash boot. Where is loader.conf, uh, et cetera, lives? And 12.0 seems to squash slash boot. So I put it back uh, with a symlink. Right. So in older versions of the FreeBSD installer, where it wasn't possible to have, uh, I think it was mostly if you enabled the automatic encryption option, um, it would put your boot on a separate pool that wasn't encrypted and your, um, it's called boot pool, and the rest of your system on a regular pool that uh, got encrypted with Gelly. Uh, and that was because the UEFI boot code did not support reading from encrypted disks yet. Um, with 12.x and later, it is not required to have it be a separate pool. It can all be one encrypted pool and it'll work fine. Uh, so if you do have a separate pool for your slash boot, uh, you probably want to get rid of that because it really makes using boot environments not work. Um, and that's not great. Um, but the slash boot directory you still need no matter what, uh, because that's where the loader lives. So the when you first start up, there's some bootstrap code. Uh, either in your MBR, like, like a legacy boot case, it's a bunch of little 512 byte files that then read bigger files that read bigger files. Um, but that eventually loads slash boot slash loader, uh, which then can read from the file system. Uh, it has drivers for UFS and ZFS, and then it can read you know slash boot slash kernel slash kernel and load that and, and boot your system. So you still need slash boot, um, but yes, part of the Installer, I think it's actually FreeBSD update that likes to eat the slash boot symlink to boot pool slash boot. Um, but luckily, uh, it's not required to have a separate pool anymore. Um, I have instructions somewhere that um, Joseph Mimrone wrote uh, on how to, like the steps to transition away. Uh, I don't have that handy though. Uh, but there are instructions I can get, I'll try to find them later, uh, to transition away from having two separate boot pools. Well said, Alan. Bruce, are you satisfied with that answer? Or do you need uh, Alan to further elaborate on that? Bruce says, I guess that is why boot environments did not work well for me. Yes, uh, the, the reason why I was uh, so driven to get all the EFI stuff working uh, with Gelly was so that uh, you could have boot environments because when you have your slash boot and your kernel in this case in a separate pool from your root file system, then obviously a snapshot of one doesn't include the other. And so boot environments just don't work at all. Uh, so yeah, you uh, want to migrate away. And as soon as I can remember the domain name for uh, Joseph's personal site, I uh, will be able to find the instructions. <laughs> Uh, I think there was another question. Yep, absolutely. This question comes in from Crest. Uh, his question is, is support for rerouting uh, into Gelly encrypted ZFS pools planned for BSD install? Um, not by me, but that doesn't mean it uh, can't happen. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, reroute is a way to, uh, it's similar to the Linux pivot route. And the idea is um, you have, you've booted up the system uh, in, in many cases, for example, if you are uh, using a rented server somewhere um, and you don't have console access, you can boot into a minimal environment that's just enough to allow you to SSH into the server. 
and then you can you know type in the Geli password and mount your Geli encrypted root file system, and then reroute allows you to switch to having your root uh, file system be some other device. So it actually works by basically rebooting the system, but without going to the BIOS. The kernel um, cleans itself up, or so the kernel stays loaded, but it basically shuts down all of user land, switches to a different root file system, and then boots the machine again. Uh, and this would allow you to have a Geli encrypted server that's remote, but if it reboots, you SSH into this temporary system, uh, type in the right passwords or keys to mount the encrypted system, and then reroute into that. Um, I don't know how general of a use case that is to have support for that in BSD install, um, especially since you know if you're putting out a server somewhere, you might not be using BSD install to do it. But um, you know, I think it would there might be enough people that would be interested in it. I just uh, I personally don't have the inclination to do it. Um, but now that reboot is a thing, that's uh, interesting. Fair enough. So we have another question coming in now from Jason. He says, is there plans for in-place kernel patching without rebooting at some point? Um, I know at EuroBSDCon in Romania, so 2018, there was a talk about how to do it with Dtrace uh, and some work in progress there. And uh, there's been some other work uh, as well to have something similar. Um, so that's about all I know on that part. Uh, so there's some progress, but it's not you know finished. Um, and I don't know if anybody's actively working on it right this minute. The other one uh, I was going to mention is there is some work going on for um, a rescue system type thing. So when the system boots up, it reserves a small amount of memory and puts a different kernel and MFS root into that. And when the system panics, uh, it actually basically reboots, uh, switches to that other kernel with its MFS, uh, which gives you enough of a system to actually uh, do a more useful panic. Um, basically, it runs in only that reserved amount of memory and there's a device it can read from to dump the memory of the running system or the crash system uh, so that you could do a crash dump to, uh, especially on a, a machine that has a lot of memory and you don't want to have you know 128 gigs of swap, but you need to dump 128 gigs of memory. Um, being able to boot into a rescue kernel during a panic and have access to a real file system would be interesting. And Colin mentions that uh, kernel patches without rebooting would never be guaranteed to work. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so we have another question coming in now saying, any recommendations for an IDE for code spelunking, uh, spelunking FreeBSD source? Uh, recursive grep sucks. Uh, Git grep is a little better. Uh, and I know many FreeBSD developers like uh, AG, the, the silver searcher and stuff. Um, I know some slightly more older fashion type people like something like Cscope, uh, which is good for you know quickly looking up stuff in the source code. Uh, for IDEs, I'm not sure how many of them really handle a code base the size of FreeBSD. Um, you know, a lot of IDEs are, are meant for slightly more manageable projects. <laughs> Fair enough, we're getting quite a bit of activity now in the IRC chat. Uh, another question has come in uh, say, uh, asking, what is the schedule for 13.0? Has that been talked about yet? Um, so uh, schedule should be announced relatively soon, uh, but the idea is that it will be done, 13.0 uh, will be released by March of 2021. Uh, so aiming for approximately that 2.5 year cadence, although maybe uh, a little bit early this time. Uh, but the plan is to get uh, to a schedule where there's uh, a fixed date. And also, when 13.0 is released, we'll include the announcement of when 14.0 will be so that people have two in a bit years uh, notice that that's when that's going to happen and try to be uh, a little more proactive there and, and less guessing.
All right, very good. So we have another question coming in asking, is SysRC the suggested safer way to make changes to etcrc.conf instead of editing? Yes, um, one of the interesting things, uh, it's kind of a limitation of SysRC, but it, one of the, SysRC was specifically written in shell, so it would use the exact same parsing as rc.conf uses, because it, uh, it uh, the RC script itself uh, is written in shell. And so uh, that's why it has the limitation that it can't use, um, you can't use it to also edit things like sysrc.conf, where the uh, the not variables, but the the names of the OIDs have dots in them, which is uh, a valid assignment in shell. Um, so my biggest peeve with sysrc is you can't also use it for setting sysctls. Uh, but the reason for that is because it was specifically written in the same language as RC, so the parsing would be exactly the same. Because otherwise, there's always some edge case you might run into where sysrc might not detect something that was invalid that uh, would cause your rc.conf to break. Uh, so yes, sysrc is specifically designed to be uh, the right uh, way to do uh, rc.conf editing. Oh, looks like someone just chimed in in the chat here. Uh, someone asked, even with escapes? Uh, yes, I think even with escapes. Fair enough. So we have another question from Crest now. Uh, he asks, I'm writing my own key exchange daemon just for IPsec. Is there any documentation for the FreeBSD extensions to the pfkv 2 API outside the code? I didn't know that there were any extensions. <laughs> uh, maybe someone else in chat actually knows the answer to that. Uh, so Colin says he wishes that there was a sysrc-like tool that could handle loader.conf. Again, it can handle um, the non-tunable uh, sysctl type ones. Uh, but I think there is an, a separate thing in ports that can handle it. Uh, I think it might also have been written by Devin. Uh, but yes, it is sometimes a little sad that sysrc can't just do both, but uh, the reason why it's done the way it is done is compelling enough uh, to me to solve the problem or to to make me stop whining. <laughs> uh, so Jason's had the, the question about 13 and 11. Oh, OK. Oh, I see it now. It didn't preface with a with yes, the there. Yes, Jason. <laughs> but Jason could have just read the question himself. Well, that's that's fair. Like yeah, so, so, yeah, so my question is, um, uh, with the five-year cadence uh, or five-year support lifecycle of uh, basically 11 and 12, uh, with 13 coming out, will that overlap 11 at any point? Like, uh, will there be like a, a three-month migration period? I think that there might end up being that for 11, although our goal is not to have to support three different branches at once. Uh, so it is kind of this uh, balancing act of trying to um, leave some overlap but not create too much extra work. Uh, and also not to mean that we have to build packages for that many different versions at once as well. Um, so there's a bit of push and pull happening there. Um, but I don't know, how many people go directly from uh, you know a branch to two branches ahead, I wonder. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll sort of uh, go back with our, our use case. There's, there's finally an issue that's been bugging us that we haven't been able to use 12 at all uh, for Beehive hypervisors, and it's finally um, been sorted out in 12. But we're so far down the 12 tree now that there's no point in putting the R and D effort into uplifting yeah. to 12. So um, that's why we're looking at going from 11 straight to 13 because we're so close to 13 now that that's why yeah uh so i think there will be some overlap i don't know exactly how much it'll be uh but i guess i think the end date for the 11 branch is already announced right uh and then if we know that 13 is going to be the end of march 2021 then uh i guess that answers the question 
yeah, we can we can sort of put up with a uh, uh, like a unsupported period for a little bit of time as we work up to it because obviously we're testing thirteen now, right up to the point where as soon as it goes, we, we're ready. To, we're ready to cut across. Um, it looks like stable eleven expires in September of twenty twenty one, so there should be probably more overlap than we would like. But uh, so, has the next question? Just waiting for some. I think we're all caught up on questions for the time being. Oh, Bruce has another one. Is there a reason why FreeBSD Update doesn't give some kind of countdown of the number of times you need to type FreeBSD Upgrade Install? It seems like it needs an extra round in FreeBSD 12.x. Um, so there's an extra round if you're upgrading from 11 to 12. Because uh, normally the first round does the kernel, the second round does uh, user land, and then there's a third round that if you've done a major version change, it deletes the old libraries that uh, you don't need anymore. Uh, but yes, a countdown would be uh, a good idea. Uh, I know I added a safety belt a couple of years ago where you can't start a new upgrade when you haven't finished the old one yet because that caused um, Dan Lynn Gill to lock himself out of SSH or something because he had a newer kernel. So you named dash A said he was running the newer version, but he had never done the second FreeBSD upgrade or update install. And so he hadn't actually updated his user land. And eventually he got uh, in some predicament where uh, SSH was trying to use something that didn't the new kernel didn't do anymore or something and uh, couldn't log in anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. We have another question coming in saying, hello, I have a silly question. There are no silly questions. Um, I should record my talk for the BSD can. How do you pronounce 4.4 BSD, sysctl, mib, and OID? I'm Italian, smiley face. But that's how I pronounce those. <laughs> yes. Um, that's the one that I, I found uh, interesting is meeting people at conferences is uh, there's the people like me that say sysctl, and then there's the people say syscuttle. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, IOCTL versus IOCTL. Uh, and I always found that uh, kind of amusing. <laughs> uh, yes, it was like Ed is saying the same thing in the chat room. Because, um, yes, the other one that makes me giggle every time is when uh, Olivier Couchard LeBay is giving his uh, talk about um, um, firewall benchmarking and so on. Because he's French, he calls it. You know, it's it's ten gigabits, <laughs> and that always makes me laugh a little bit. I don't know why. Uh, I think it, most, almost any way you say it, people will know what you mean. Uh, so I wouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, but yes, the way that I would do it is is four dot four BSD sysctl mib in OID. Uh, and in the mib and OID one is interesting because if one I'm saying the letters and one I'm making it a word, and I just randomly decided. Oftentimes it's because you know, it's the way you heard it first or the way you read it in your head uh, and things like that. Yeah, it usually comes down to how people were first introduced to it. Some people call it IF config, some people call it IF config. It, yeah. It's just potato, potato. Oh, someone else says, I've also heard 4.4 BSD rather than 4.4 BSD. Yes, uh, that is very common. But yes, I like Bruce's idea of a, a, a countdown in FreeBSD uh, upgrade install saying, you know, don't forget you still have these other steps uh, to do. Yeah, I kind of agree with Ed that while MIB works as by turning it into a word, OID doesn't really. And so <laughs> I said OID. Uh, we might also have just have the fact that in general, even when it's not uppercase, when we say ID, we, you know, it's ID, not ID. Ed's also asking, how do you pronounce Etsy or slash? <laughs> See, I say ETC, and a lot of people say Etsy. And, uh, you know, there's that one. Uh, there's a couple more questions that have come in. Yep. Just reading them now. Uh, I understand that there's a big push to align ZOL and ZOF, but has there been any discussion when RAID Z? Uh, expansion will be pushed into FreeBSD. Is there an expected target? 
Uh, so the alignment of ZFS on Linux and the, the kind of ZFS on FreeBSD thing happened yesterday. Uh, so the official OpenZFS repo on GitHub now contains support for both operating systems, and they are aligned. Um, obviously, the work remaining is to pull that into uh, FreeBSD and replace our older Illumos-based uh, copy of uh, ZFS with the newer one, uh, which it's still mostly the same code. Uh, and there's no, even though it originally came from ZFS on Linux, there's no Linux code in there or anything like that. Um, uh, and then, yes, new features will go into that repo and then come into FreeBSD. Uh, RAID Z expansion, um, there's not a specific target yet. It's currently uh, a work in progress. Work has stalled a little bit. Um, I had dinner with Matt Ahrens in February, uh, talk about it. And uh, you know, there's hope uh, that progress will be made uh, soon and that that will eventually get integrated and then we would get pulled into FreeBSD very quickly, I think. All right, another question now. Uh, Crest has another question. He asks, what is the best way to deal with lots of Galley encrypted disks? I have a server with 90 dual path disks and 24 logical CPUs. Neither the default nor one thread per device works well for all workloads. Yeah, um, Gelly needs to be fixed to instead of having n threads per Gelly instance, to have a pool of some number of threads and then all the disks uh, work out of that pool to avoid uh, the problem you end up with. You know, Even if you have one thread per Gelly, if you have 90 disks, uh, you end up with 90 threads and only 24 CPUs and they're all fighting with each other or whatever. Uh, so yeah, um, there's not a great solution right now, sadly. All right, Crest has another question. Does FreeBSD support booting from ZFS pools with open ZFS uh, data set encryption enabled? So FreeBSD doesn't support uh, open ZFS data set encryption in the version of ZFS in base yet. If you install the open ZFS port, it does but that's not hooked up to the boot code. Um, so that work's not been done yet, uh, but I'm hoping I can con uh, Thomas Soom, who did a bunch of the work um, for the other recent ZFS features in the FreeBSD bootloader, because he also ported the bootloader to Illumos, uh, to do it. So not supported yet, uh, but is expected to be supported by time, or you know, as part of pulling uh, open ZFS into FreeBSD over the next couple of months. Uh, the idea is hopefully to have that done at least six months before 13.0 is released. Uh, so we have lots of time for uh, any issues to be worked out before we have our, our release. Um, I just had one uh, follow up from the last uh, meetup was around uh, the package um, and FreeBSD update uh, performance issues that we have down here. Um, now, I have traced that the package updates go to the uh, west coast of USA for, for us. Um, however, the FreeBSD updates seem to be just going to the east coast for some reason. Is there no mirrors for the uh, FreeBSD update components? Uh, so FreeBSD I update components, I think, have more mirrors. Uh, that'd be a good question we get a for Colin. We uh, get the live stream is a little bit behind, so Colin hasn't heard your question yet, but you'll hear it in about 20 seconds, probably. Uh, and maybe he'll be able to chime in. Because I thought he was using uh, like uh, Amazon Route 53 stuff to automatically route it to a bunch of mirrors he controls uh, for FreeBSD updates. Uh, so, uh, that might, but, but that may be because of some of our IP addresses. We get we, you know, IPv4 is like scarce. And um, some of the ISPs are buying different addresses from different places, so they're not being realigned in, in global, yes. data, global databases. And that's probably um, what's happening. I do that on purpose at home, uh, so that um, when I'm watching Netflix, I get American Netflix. <laughs> uh, but yes, as my, uh, yes. Colin That's says huge. he needs to fix the mirroring situation for FreeBSD update. Uh, for package, uh, I worked on that over the previous weekend here. Uh, and I think I have a working prototype uh, for um, having Poudre output packages where each package includes uh, the first eight characters of the SHA-256 hash in the file name. 
so they get renamed after you create the package, uh, so that the uh, packages can be run through a CDN that does caching, uh, where we could you know automatically have uh, high-speed mirrors for it all over the world and have it be uh, much more performant. The problem currently is because the content of the file changes, but the URL doesn't because there isn't the hash in the file name. Means that you would get stale copies all the time, or we'd have to, you know, purge the CDN, which doesn't really work well because currently our package set contains over five million unique uh, file names or paths because you know there's uh, your favorite package in whatever the version was for FreeBSD, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 for 32-bit and 64-bit times uh, AMD 64 ARM. Uh, MIPS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but hopefully a solution uh, for that problem uh, has moved forward more significantly than it has in the last two years, last weekend, when I had some free time because of the holiday. <laughs> well, yeah, lad, if you need a uh, hand for testing with that, I'm quite happy to handle there. Cool. All right, looks like Bruce has another question. Is is there an easy and safe way to send an SSH passphrase into a script, uh, like prompt for it and use it later instead of having it not be an unsafe command line argument? Uh, he says, I expect that I could write an ex expect TCL, uh, TCL script to do it, but was not sure how else to send it after the command starts. Um. One way might be to do it with an SSH agent of some kind uh, so that you would enter the password uh, and have uh, the key loaded um, and have the program be able to access the SSH key that way uh, and then you know uh, unload the keys when you're done. Um, that might expose it a little bit more than you're really hoping, though. Uh, so it's hard to say. Uh, and I see Colin notes that. Uh, He's really hoping that package base gets finished someday and he can get rid of FreeBSD update altogether. <laughs> John's busy. I'll read the next question out. Um, is it possible to create an event FD or event file descriptor for user space process without running under the Linux API? Um. Not probably that particular ABI. I'm sure you could use uh, the KQ type thing to do something similar. Uh, depends also what kind of events you're trying to deal with. Uh, I'm not that familiar with event FD, so I don't know exactly what the analog would be if there is one. Um, next question um, from Fwit. Uh, Freak Labs, uh, what is the status of the VPC work? Is it still ongoing or is it stalled? Uh, I don't know. As far as I know, it is stalled. Uh, Ed mentions that package base is hopefully not too far off. Uh, so Chris says what he's looking for is kind of like the K event, uh, event filter user face, but uh, a file descriptor that can be passed to another process. I have no idea. Connor asks, what's the best way to send an environment variable into a, a SH shell script? Like you want to um, set it in the shell script and have it only in that shell script, or you want to uh, you know, export it so that everything started from that shell script sees that, uh, for example, the extended path, or do you want to set it so that every shell that starts has that extended path. Uh, and do you want to do that for just your user or all users? So it's the equivalent of set environment path slash foo. I think it's just export path equals foo. Another question now, um, asking for the status of the Git migration. Uh, yes, yeah, so Ed says the Git migration is still in progress. Uh, they found that the SVN to Git converter has a number of bugs and limitations that they're trying to work around. Uh, so that we get a good conversion. Uh, you know, the kind of sticky thing with Git is that you know, you uh, while you can change history, you don't want to do that because it makes any fork um, of that repo not work properly anymore. Um, and so they want to do the conversion once and have it be perfect. Uh, it's not something we can fix up after. Uh, and that's why it's 
uh, taking a bit longer than, uh, you know, it's not just a matter of doing the conversion, but of uh, making sure the conversion is right. Because uh, our repo goes back a very long way and contains uh, lots of edge cases for anything that's going to try to convert all that history. <laughs> Just waiting for some new questions in the chat right now. Looks like people are continuing to expand on the, the previous question there. The shell script stuff. Yeah, the shell script stuff. Uh, and Ed expands a bit on the Git question, saying that uh, they also need to have an existing, uh, all the existing vendor imports fixed up uh, and figure out how we're going to move forward with those. Um, currently in the way we use SVN, uh, when we pull in source code from other projects, uh, for example, TCP dump, um, we have a vendor branch where we suck uh, all of that into uh, a branch, and then we tag that, uh, and then we SVN copy that into the contrib stuff that we then ship as part of FreeBSD, so that when there's the next release of TCP dump, we can import that uh, over top uh, and then get a diff of just what changed in upstream uh, TCP dump and then merge that into the contrib version of TCP dump where we put any FreeBSD local patches. Kind of a question more than a discussion point. He says, I've been looking into getting SSH running only using SSH certificates for authentication in our environment. Is there a good management tool in FreeBSD for dealing with signing certs uh, for different users slash teams, or if anyone has some examples of trying to use SSH certificates in production? And to manage the auth pros and cons. Hmm. Um, I wonder if... Um, Dan has any good ideas. I see Steve Wills mentions uh, there's a port under the security category called teleport that is apparently good for that. And uh, Connor also give that one a plus one. Ah, and yes, Colin brings up a good point. Um, uh, Michael W. Lucas wrote a book called SSH Mastery. Uh, and it has lots of goodies for uh, answering those types of questions. Ah, and he says that that's where he learned about this whole concept. <laughs> um, you might want to check uh, if you read the first edition of SSH Mastery, there's now a second edition, which might have uh, more stuff in it. But yes, thanks to Steve uh, and uh, Connor for recommending Teleport, uh, which might be the solution for you. Next question is, what will happen to EuroBSDCon 2020? Uh, so what EuroBSDCon has decided is at the end of their call for papers, which is open until near the end of May. So in the very early June, uh, after the call for papers is finished, is when they will decide uh, if it makes sense to try to have the conference or not. Um, so before speakers are notified, they will decide so that, and they recommend nobody try to make travel arrangements until uh, they have that announcement. Um, but at that point is when they will decide uh, whether it makes sense to try to have the conference or not. Um, and then they will let the speakers know uh, that they've been accepted or whatever. Another question from Bruce. Just found a command to expand aliases and bash scripts. Uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but shopped dash s expand underscore aliases. Uh, what does shopped mean? I'm guessing it's shell options. I don't know uh, what that does. <laughs> uh, I think I've seen it before in a few places, uh, but it doesn't appear to be uh, something that's in regular SH. Uh, so I don't know. And yes, I'm kind of with uh, Steve Wills there that uh, aliases are kind of bad. And I generally uh, don't have many of them. Of course, sometimes I make the same typo over and over again and be like, I should just make an alias, but I don't. Do you punish yourself with SL, Alan? <laughs> no, I only subjected <laughs> you to that. OK, thanks, man. Uh, so John was uh, mentioning in our user group meeting that um, he often accidentally types SL instead of LS. Uh, so I told him to package install uh, SL, and he did. And then when next time he makes a typo, a uh, little ASCII art train steam locomotive drives across the screen. Uh, and you know every time that happens, you're like, right, I will type LS, not SL. Uh, for me, the bigger one is actually typing DC instead of CD. What really got me about the SL command is that it actually has flags to make the steam locomotive various sizes and float to the top of the screen. And yeah, 
it's good to know that exists. Yeah, somebody uh, should expand it. So if you use the capital G option, which makes LS output colors to make the, the locomotive have colors. Uh, and then, you know, if you need other fun things like that, uh, there's also cow say, uh, which if you run cow say and then a string of text, a little cow will pop up with a speech bubble containing your text. Uh, and there are flags for that one. Uh, you can get like Darth Vader and pigs and cows and goats and a bunch of other ASCII art. So we have SL, we have cow say. Does anyone else in the chat have any other recommendations for fun commands? <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, the one we covered on BSD now uh, a couple weeks ago was someone alias their clear command into a function so that like one in 10 times when you run clear, you'll get a steam locomotive instead of uh, you know, a regular screen clearing. Uh, or uh, you know, sometimes it'll do the matrix thing uh, with the reigning characters and then clear the screen after. Jason, you have a feature request? No, I was referring to your uh... Uh, request about uh, putting colors and stuff like that in the uh, in the steam train. And, oh. uh, going, oh, Alan wants his feature request. Uh, well, I, I noticed SL moved over to GitHub recently. Because uh, I, I noticed that it, it had like it was like version seven or something. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize how old SL was, uh, or how you know frequently it seems to still be updated. There's another question. Um, any hope of uh, greater than NTLM v1 for mount SMBFS? So two yeah, or higher. Um, yeah, uh, somebody was mentioning that the SMBFS in uh, SmartOS or Lumos uh, supports SMB v2, uh, and that that might be usable. Uh, but I've not had a chance to go look. Um, because, yes, something for mounting SMB that isn't V1 would be nice. Uh, although Crest mentions that uh, Fuse has a, a Samba thing, apparently. Probably brings us to the next one. Um, uh, uh, is it EX, e XFAT? EXFAT? Um, uh, with that, that now being um, open sourced by Microsoft, uh, will that be uh, worked on and introduced into base, or will it still be you know, not a a sort of compatible license, so uh, will be something that sits in ports. Yeah, I'm not sure what the license on it is. I know there was problems with patents before, but I think uh, they've uh, changed that now. Um, yeah, I don't know about XFAT. I know the EXT4 stuff got some work, I think, from Alan Summers uh, last summer or something. Uh, I don't know the status of that off the top of my head, uh, but XFAT would... Uh, Definitely be interesting. Although now that they have uh, ZFS for Windows, I've uh, not worried as much about uh, being able to move files back and forth uh, between other OSs. But I realize that not everybody uses ZFS on all of their computers like I do. Although m most of my Windows computer is mostly talking to ZFS via Samba. Uh, reminder to vote in the poll about uh, when you would like office hours to be in the future. Uh, obviously, our turnout this time was uh, quite a bit less than the first one. I don't know how much that has to do with time. Another question from Crest is coming in now. He's, he asks, how stable is Ceph on FreeBSD? Is there any hope for an in-kernel CephFS? Um, I don't know how stable it is. I know somebody was working on it, and I think they've got uh, pretty far, uh, and it's working. Um, I think their focus was on the block driver more. Uh, I think they wanted to use it for VMs to use Ceph uh, and have their backend storage be distributed or whatever. Um, so I don't know about an in-kernel CephFS, but I think they were looking at an in-kernel uh, Ceph block driver, at least, to basically do the, I think, the Ceph equivalent of what a ZVOL is in ZFS. The, I think the best way to track the progress of that is to look at the FreeBSD quarterly status reports, uh, find one that mention Ceph in it, we'll have the contact information for the person that was working on it, or the, the people that were working on it. I think there was also some work on Gluster. Uh, I don't know how far that got. Ah, a Ceph jump gate driver. That's an interesting approach. But you know, all this talk of file systems uh, makes me think back to the, the story uh, of Pavel Dolodek when he did the port of ZFS to FreeBSD. 
uh, there have been, especially around that time, which I guess was like 2006 or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. It was before I was really uh, a member of the FreeBSD community. Um, that a number of different uh, projects had tried to port file systems to FreeBSD, and they often got to the point of um, having uh, read-only support for a file system, but never got to read, write, and so on. And so when he got to the point of read-only for ZFS, he's like, no, I'm not stopping here. I'm going to keep going. Uh, and he worked for basically three weeks, three weeks straight, uh, but at the end, I had rewrite support for ZFS uh, working on FreeBSD, and, and then you know the rest is history. I thought, I thought at least some of the Ceph stuff was later than early 2017, but I could be wrong. And seeing that email address, I realized I've actually met the person that was doing the Ceph work in person at FOSDEM. I must have been 20... 19 or 18. Colin says he's surprised nobody starts with write-only support for a file system. You know, it might be easier. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Imagine quitting after getting write support going and not doing read. We're still caught up in the channel in terms of questions. Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, and look at that. Two at the same time just came in. Uh, what do we got here? Is there any avenue to get more package flavors added for a package? Example, adding a package flavor of Nextcloud to support Postgres SQL alongside the current flavors uh, for different PHP versions. Huh. So I think, um, I imagine that's, it's mostly a matter of a couple of lines in the ports make file to make it do that. Uh, you do have to start worrying about the, you know, the uh, exponential growth of the number of possible flavors when you start multiplying, you know, PHP version times Postgres version, uh, or PHP version times database with its different versions. You know, if you support uh, three versions of PHP, uh, and then your choice of MariaDB, MySQL, or Postgres, uh, and then for each of those three or more versions, suddenly the number of packages you're compiling gets really high. Um, for some of that, the uh, provides requires stuff might be a better solution, where when you install Nextcloud, it just requires a database uh, of some kind. Uh, and that will mean we won't need as many flavors. Uh, but I think uh, for flavors now, it's either um, look at doing it yourself with the Porter's Handbook and the, the ports make file and uh, post that as a PR, uh, or even just uh, a PR or an email to the maintainer asking uh, if they would uh, consider doing that, I suppose. Wouldn't the best um, option there be to remove um, uh, remove the requirement for databases? So, so take up, strip out a lot of the dependencies and only have the actual explicit dependencies that are required to, to install something like Nextcloud and then let it up to the end user to then do you know, package install, MySQL client, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, possibly, although some of it comes down to usability where I want to be able to just type package install Nextcloud and I have everything and Nextcloud just works. And if I want to, to do it slightly custom and be like, I'm going to use Postgres instead, then I can uh, kind of do that. Um, I think in a... Uh, Probably not for switching between MySQL and Postgres, uh, but for switching like versions of Postgres, there's the um, default version stuff, and you can compile packages. You know, you can say always compile my packages to use uh, MariaDB or Percona rather than vanilla MySQL or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I know at one time we had talked about um, maybe not even flavors, but like looking at compiling. The different options for packages so that you wouldn't have to compile from ports just to get it. Um, but when we looked at you know the fact that the Nginx port currently has I think 107 different uh, binary options, some of which are mutually exclusive, uh, trying to compile packages of just all of those, let alone all the possible combinations, uh, just gets out of hand really quickly. And then, you know, it's always hard to decide if the defaults should be, you know, almost everything turned on to be useful or, you know, the default should be kind of what average people need or the default should be, you know, the don't bring in the entire kitchen sink just because I asked for a web server. Uh, 
Another question from Bruce is Tail Dashar, the greatest command you never knew you needed. Um, I remember uh, Brian Cantrell's talk about Tail Dash F uh, really hit home with me because my company also uses Tail Dash F for billing. And uh, if it didn't work on FreeBSD, it'd be very bad. But luckily, FreeBSD didn't have the bug he was talking about. Uh, I did not know about tail dash R, but I don't know that I have a use case for it. Uh, the R option uh, causes the input to be displayed in reverse order by line <laughs> and changes the meaning of uh, dash B, dash C, and dash N. Uh, when the dash R option is specified, these options specify the number of bytes, lines, or 512 byte blocks to display instead of the bytes, lines, or blocks from the beginning or end of the input. Uh, the default with dash R is display the entire file, but backwards. New question just came in. How does one use Wayland on FreeBSD? What drivers does it work with? Uh, I know that you can-ish use Wayland. I don't know anything more about that. Maybe Steve has an answer, though, uh, or, or somebody we, we, reports. Did we, we, we missed a question from Crest. Uh, what is the policy for ports installing files on the root file system? I maintain sysutils S6 port and would like a flavor installing to slash instead of prefix slash. Um, I know there have been a couple of ports that have options like that. Um, I know OpenSSH used to have uh, an option to basically replace the base SSH. Uh, and um, there are a couple others. Uh, I don't know what the policy uh, from Package Manager is, or, uh, but um, it's not completely unheard of to have uh, an option in ports to install uh, to the base system instead of to the prefix. Um, and a flavor that uses that might uh, be interesting. Uh, but Steve uh, Wills can probably give a better answer to that question about what package manager says is allowed. New question. I was trying to work on the eBPF XDP hook implementation of FreeBSD uh, for Nick Vertio, if, uh, if underscore VTNet. Any pointers slash suggestions on how, to, how I may approach this? Uh, I know in general what eBPF is, but the rest of that sentence is confusing to me. <laughs> uh, not my domain. Um, best people to talk to might be look at it. The, over the last uh, couple of years at uh, conferences like BSD Can, there have been a few people that presented about eBPF. Uh, they probably know more about eBPF than I do, and they might be the right people to ask for pointers. Uh, it's for a Google Summer of Code projects. Um, the, the mentors listed there uh, are probably the best people to reach out to uh, for questions, but uh, yeah, I don't know uh, much about eBPF at all. New questions just came up. Will KTLS send and receive make it into 13.0? Um, KTLS uh, send file is done and I think is already in 13. Uh, receive, I'm not sure. Um, John's not here to answer that. Uh, but he's also been, uh, I know that um, Rick Macklem has been looking at using the set and receive uh, KTLS bits for uh, TLS encrypted NFS uh, in the kernel. So uh, there will be a consumer for a receive as well. Uh, so I think if, uh, I know send is done, if receive isn't done, it likely uh, would be in 13. Uh, even if the NFS bits aren't finished by then, just so that uh, it will be able to. Uh, and Steve is looking for someone to finish the virtual memory compression project, uh, which apparently ran as a Google Summer of Code last year, and there's a prototype. It just needs uh, finishing. Another new question from Bruce. Can I do a FreeBSD install on the same version of FreeBSD I already have? FreeBSD install upgrade dash R 12.1 release on a 12.1 existing install. I removed the NTP package and the base version of NTPD uh, files were no longer there. Better question for Colin, but that might work. You might have to do, there's another flag to FreeBSD update to tell what version is upgrading from. You might have to try to trick it. I don't, I don't know. I know FreeBSD update has a, uh, 
IDS command that can check for files that have the hash changed or whatever, um, but um, missing files, I don't know if it really has the stuff to restore them or not. It's, uh, yeah, the other option is downloading base.txz uh, and grabbing the files you need out of there and then, you know, FreeBSD update to make sure that they get patched up because I think there has been one update to NTP since 12.1 uh, shipped. Generic ZFS question, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, ZFS send to something like S3 or V2. Um, is it possible? Yeah, so ZFS send itself is just a binary blob. Uh, and you can do anything you want with it, including write it to a tape drive or, or whatever, and then store it. And you know, five years from now, pipe that into ZFS receive, and it will reconstruct the file system. Doing incrementals that way is a little trickier because uh, you know, if you send an incremental every day off to S3, when you go to reconstruct the file system, you're going to have to start with your full backup and then apply every single incremental on top of it to get back to uh, what you were looking for. Although if you do uh, something like the differential backup or whatever, where you do uh, everything since the last full um, and replace the old incrementals with those, that helps. But then you have to have a snapshot from five years ago around somewhere uh, <laughs> or whatever. But um, it is possible, yes. Is there any checksumming um, uh, going to be put into like ZFS send? Uh, I've had a time where I've had bit rot occur on a ZFS stream, a ZFS send stream, and you've gone to recover it and it's gone. No, the stream's not valid. Uh, so in before resumable ZFS send, there was only one checksum at the very end. Now there's a checksum for each object or whatever. Uh, but yes, if it detects a problem, it just means that send stream is no good. Uh, and if you don't have another one, then that could be a problem. Uh, separately, there's work out of Dato to be able to, uh, when on your pool you detect corruption, to be able to use a send stream to get the right bits out of it and basically uh, use a send stream to just get you know the four sectors you need uh, that got corrupted or whatever um, to basically be able to repair a, a corrupted pool by using a send stream. Uh, but if your send stream itself has corruption in it, uh, then it's not really usable. Uh, so you'd have to do something like the, the par stuff or the parity thing uh, to it if, if uh, what you're writing it to isn't guaranteed to not lose it on you. Looks like we have another new question. What is the rule of thumb for bumping? Um, what would that be, I guess? Underscore, underscore, FreeBSD underscore version is the OS version. It's um, uh, the ABI version. Oh. Um, so in head, it's uh, so it, like on 12.1, it's 1201000 or something like that. Um, so in head, the point is you bump it every time you change something that isn't backwards compatible. So if you change the size of a struct or uh, add, change the version of a library or do anything where older stuff might not be compatible, you bump it. And that's how, um, that's why it's encoded into the packages that we compile. Uh, so that if you try to run packages that need a newer version of the FreeBSD ABI than you have, um, then it will uh, be like, hey, that might not work. Uh, so yeah, by default, when you do a ZFS send, it, uh, with no flags, it defaults to the oldest, most compatible stream format. Uh, so that doesn't do any compression, doesn't use embedded block pointers, doesn't support uh, records larger than 128K, uh, doesn't support encryption and all this other stuff. Um, so if you're using ZFSN, you might want to look at the flags uh, and decide which ones you want to enable. Um, you want to make sure that the machines you're going to be receiving that stream on supports them. Uh, but the compressed option uh, saves a lot of work, because instead of uncompressing the block, sending it over the network, and then maybe recompressing it on the other side, you can send it over the network already compressed. And the, like the capital L flag is useful if you use blocks, uh, like the uh, large blocks feature, uh, where you can say, you know, 
for large files, I want to store them in one megabyte chunks instead of 128k chunks. That can save uh, some overhead and so on. Uh, and you want them to stay in the big chunks as they go across the network. Um, and the dash E flag for embedded block pointers. Uh, that is, if you have really small blocks, uh, like directory entries and stuff, that contain, like I think it's less than 120 something bytes of data, um, there's enough room, or I think it's 114 is the right answer. Uh, there's enough room in the ZFS block pointer that normally contains you know, where on the hard drive that data lives um, to actually write the compressed version of that like 110 bytes into the block pointer itself. And so you don't actually have to allocate uh, somewhere else. Uh, and basically in the space where you normally store things like the checksum and the, and the date stamp, uh, it writes the data. And then the block above that in the, the tree that is ZFS uh, has the checksum of that block pointer. And because you've now embedded your 100 bytes of data into the block pointer, you still get a checksum and everything. Um, but it can save uh, quite a bit of extra work versus having to allocate a whole 4K sector off your, your disk uh, just to store 100 bytes of data. Uh, so I guess that, oh, we got one more question. And one more question. Uh, does anyone have any experience with Ophelia HA proxy integration on FreeBSD? If so, would you be able to share your config? Zero docs on this online. Um, I've never actually used HA proxy. Um, for the times I've needed some kind of proxy, I've just used Nginx because it's the tool I already know inside out. Uh, and my needs haven't been, uh, you know, something. Uh, different that like AHA proxy provides. Uh, like I know AHA proxy works well on FreeBSD and AHA proxy, the company has sponsored you at BSDCon the last couple of years. Um, but I don't know, like as far as integration goes, what you would need to integrate. It's generally, you just run it as, you know, the web server proxy thing that it is. Uh, now, I don't know what the Athelia stuff or if you're trying to like, do authentication and integrate with FreeBSD's authentication or what? Ah, so apparently they want to set up Othelia with um, the one-time uh, token password stuff. All right, uh, I guess we are out of time. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and uh, remember to vote in the poll about uh, when we will have this meeting next. Um, and uh, we will see you then. Uh, I think the plan is probably in about two weeks uh, and the time uh, will be announced when we uh, give everybody a chance to vote in the poll. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Alan.